My name is Ed Calderon. I'm a former Baja police agent. I currently work as a security consultant in the United States. This is how crime works. Gun smuggling has armed the people that killed a lot of the people that I used to work with. A lot of these uh, groups are actually stockpiling these firearms for long periods of time. It's hard for anybody to keep track of numbers and what gets found and what doesn't get found in a country where realistically nobody's keeping count. I think the flow is this. Uh, drugs make their way north and firearms and money make their way south. 70% of all firearms come from the north, from the United States. Operación Hormiga, they call it Operation Ant, basically. Uh, individuals carrying these small pistols across the border is a very common thing. So how many times can they cross the border? Well, if they're Americans, they're, there's no limit to how many times they can cross that border. It's a pretty easy process to uh, uh, grabbing an AK-47, taking it apart into its basic components, putting it in a backpack, and just walking across uh, some of the ports of entry. Another one is just basically having some of these firearms uh, uh, duct tape and or uh, shrink wrapped onto your person. So let's imagine I have five mules. Each of them is capable of carrying around probably two guns on their legs, duct tape to their legs, maybe two more higher up on their thighs and maybe two on their chest. Just multiply that by the amount of people you have doing that on a daily basis. Uh, filling their pockets with uh, ammunition, uh, filling uh, uh, cornflakes boxes with, uh, with uh, ammunition as well. Tijuana is basically Silicon Valley when it comes to finding ways of smuggling things from uh, in th through one of the most watched borders on the planet, basically. There's body shops, there's places that install radios, there's a bunch of people with a lot of experience in modifying vehicles down there. These businesses have been known to basically construct some of these uh, concealment compartments and vehicles. Many occasions uh, we would encounter or find firearms of different kinds and different vehicle hides on, in, in and around some of the places where we operated. Things like pushing the uh, volume knob on the radio and then, and then pulling the, uh, the brake on the car will release a latch on the passenger side uh, seat, uh, revealing a, a concealed firearm. American vehicles are the preferred kind. You'll see recreational vehicles um, utilizing festive days where, you know, spring break, where you'll see a surge of uh, traffic going from the north to the south. A lot of the smuggling operations that have utilized concealment related to regular commercial shipments from the United States into Mexico of agricultural equipment, electrical appliances, a lot of these companies are basically utilized as fronts and or without knowledge of these companies, uh, they get loaded up with extra stuff uh, on their way to, towards the border as they pick up a load somewhere in the United States and try and introduce it into Mexico. Another aspect of it is uh, tunnels. Drug tunnels, again, firearms do get moved through those drug tunnels that have been operating and are still operating. Some of the most interesting ones that I, we managed to see was uh, French-style trebuchets, which are basically giant catapults flinging things across the border at some ungodly uh, speeds. Drone technology, the first crashed uh, cartel drone that I directly saw was a uh, a large quad drone uh, that crashed uh, right on the border where the Tijuana River uh, treatment plant is. We saw uh, remote control uh, vehicles, small ones, uh, toy ones basically, loaded up with uh, firearms, munitions, and money being driven across the border by radio control. This is not my opinion, but uh, the Border Patrol is one of the most uh, corrupted federal institutions in the United States. There's been many cases and convictions against them. And it's these gun runners have uh, people everywhere and have and own people in some of these ports of entry and pay corrupted officials across the border. It is interesting that you do not get searched at all at times crossing into Mexico. But if you cross into San Diego, your vehicle gets scanned, you have to step out of the car. Sometimes uh, you have to take off your backpack and put it into an x-ray machine so it gets x-rayed. Density scanners might be utilized to try and detect some of the firearms going across uh, the border. But uh, those x-rays are used sporadically. Uh, every now and then you'll get one get used and it's rare that they find something. There's explosive detection dogs out there that are trained to detect explosives. Munitions, for example. 
But again, you have to realize to not only create a dog canine program that is able to detect some of these things, uh, but to maintain them is not an easy thing. In my experience, most of the, most of the arrests that we made were pitazos. A pitazo is a slang, Mexican slang word for somebody told on them. Usually it's a personal thing, or usually it's somebody just eliminating competition. Those vehicle hides, a lot of these uh, gun runners that have been caught in the past, were random acts of pure luck or somebody uh, trying to cut uh, the competition out. Twenty-year-olds, eighteen-year-olds uh, that have a clean record get uh, hired to buy some of these guns in some of these places, and then they get gathered by the gun runners. Somebody that has a vehicle, who's a retiree American, that crosses the border regularly somehow, uh, maybe goes camping in Baja and stuff like that. It's a perfect candidate to be a mule for firearms, and uh, you load a bunch of cars with uh, people that are not who you would typically expect to stop at the border. So this is this, these they basically utilize you know, people camouflage, you know, uh, what, what do people expect to see on the border as far as a drug smuggler? So they're going to shy away from that. Women get utilized a lot, a lot to move things around. Older women, because of the cultural stigma of uh, Mexican police agents as far as trying to search, physically search a female, much less a female that is older in age. The social media is a very big part of it. Not only the advertisement of some of these things being sold in some places, but also recruitment of uh, small purchase buyers on the U.S. side. Cartels will troll uh, places like TikTok, uh, will have uh, social media accounts related to one of their members or showcasing some of their activities on, online. And you'll, you'll see wannabes or people sending DMs and stuff like that on the U.S. side, kids that want to be a part of the lifestyle. It's easy money for a kid, you know. Uh, the economy, the lack of, infra the lack of uh, opportunities for a lot of these young people, even with educations down there, it's hard, to, it's hard to find a job. I was approached several times when I was uh, going through my process of uh, turning into a police officer, and it only takes you doing something for a criminal organization like any of these cartels that operate on that border. It only takes once for them to know your name, to know how to contact you, uh, to know that you are able to provide a service once, and the first time it's voluntary, the second time it's, they're going to they're gonna tell you to do something. The person buying that gun and then handing it to somebody that's going to then traffic it down south, he got probably $200, so that's the first payment, you know. And then that gun is now going to be probably doubled down, down south or maybe 80% more of the value is going to be added on to it. So you have something that might be worth $800 and now worth 1500 down there in the hands of somebody that wants that specific gun. Uh, the further south you go, the more expensive the firearm. That's kind of the rules about it. The closer you are to the border, the cheaper it is. The gun runner might have connections and he might pay it, may, paid somebody off. Usually if it's a large shipment, uh, he'll have security with him as soon as he crosses. By this I mean people that are watching the load and move with him. You know, some of these people might uh, drive it to a body shop or they might drive it to a, one of these uh, beach resorts where you can park your camper there and that is when the deal happens. That could be where some money gets exchanged. It could have, get, it could have gotten exchanged on the, southern, uh, on, the, on the northern side, but that's when the guns become uh, property of whoever is gonna get them. I've seen uh, some of the gun runners put uh, guns into places like Tecate, which is on, uh, to the east in the desert, uh, and basically in traditional places where they can avoid military checkpoints if they can. Or sometimes they don't even care because they actually paid off some of the military as well. It is not an easy process to, get to, to procure a legal firearm in Mexico. Um, Mexico has a single blanket firearms law. There's a single firearms uh, store in Mexico, They're, and if, if, if anybody wants a firearm legally in Mexico, you have to be able to pay for a bunch of documentations and you usually end up with an overpriced pistol and not a lot of ways to buy bullets for that pistol unless you belong to a shooting club. And if you belong to a shooting club in Mexico, that's a very expensive thing. So in essence, uh, legal possession of firearms is something that upper middle class people can afford. So. People are desperate, and if they want security, usually in Mexico as a civilian, you'll go into the black market. Mm -hmm. 
most of the gun-friendly places uh, on the border are usually where these things are purchased. Texas, Arizona, sometimes even further, further north, where person-to-person -person sales and private sales are more permitted, where gun shows are pretty prevalent. And somebody will walk into a gun store and buy and purchase a couple of uh, firearms. And some of these things uh, get moved from a, permit a permissive or a place where you know, firearms laws are pretty, you know, uh, are pretty open to places like California. And the reason you see that is uh, because they're actually being utilized to pay drug loads sometimes. You also have a lot of people ordering some of these firearm parts uh, through the mail now, which is a new, uh, a new method of smuggling as well. People will buy some of these things in the United States and then mail them down to Mexico under false uh, labels and uh, declarations as far as what's inside of those boxes for accessories for firearms and being gathered in a, at a private home packaged and labeled falsely and then sent south through, through uh, packaging services. There's been many cases of uh, things being taken off uh, military bases in California, for example. Uh, uh, grenades that are clearly coming from uh, military installations in the United States and or are taken from military bases by corrupted uh, soldiers. Every now and then you'll see a you know, bigger caliber uh, 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 equipment down there. The truth is uh, those account for about 70% of illegal firearms found in Mexico in the hands of cartels and murder scenes and uh, uh, in the heads of dead sicarios. The truth is that uh, it's probably more than that. They assassinate political candidates. Uh, they use uh, explosives, terror tactics, psychological tactics. Uh, they capture, imprison uh, people. Right now, currently, there's uh, the Sinaloa cartel that's uh, historically been dominating uh, the border and a big part of Mexico. But now there's a new generation cartel, which is a very new, ultra-violent, militarized, uh, almost guerrilla force that is taking over. And with groups like these, they have very specific firearms that they want to buy. So they're not only looking for a gold-plated AK-47 anymore, they're actually looking for night vision equipment to install on their firearms. They're looking for suppressors to put on a 50 caliber precision rifle that they procure. You'll see uh, this, these commercial uh, uh, gun manufacturers making a very cool, aesthetically cartel-like pistol. It's obvious if you have a gun company creating a gold gun for a civilian market that they're trying to tap in, into a fascination and or a culture that is currently kind of being fostered, a narco culture. A narco cultura or narco culture is something in, that's been going on in Mexico for decades. The fascination or the treatment of some of these criminal organizations as a, almost a Robin Hood type, uh, type uh, character, uh, where they're robbing from the rich and stealing from the poor. I can't tell uh, you that making guns impossible to get or restricted or illegal, something like you would see in Australia, would be a solution to anything, because guns are already out there. There's a lot of people that want to blame the United States for everything. I, I think they clearly have uh, responsibility when it comes to some of the firearms uh, crossing that border. You have the United States basically outsourcing its uh, counter drug policy and counter cartel policy to, to Mexico through money. The United States, I, I would say, should do a better job of keeping track of what that money is being used for in Mexico. Some of the arrests that have been made recently by American law enforcement sharing some of their information with Mexico, like sights, uh, lasers, things of this nature, for accessories for firearms, basically. This is what's been every now and then gets caught. But again, it's a drop in the bucket with what actually gets through. When we saw some of this activity, and who do we tell? Do we tell the same uh, law enforcement agencies that didn't uh, let us know about all those guns walking across that border that ended up killing a, lot, a bunch of my friends. You know, it, it was my experience to, to actually uh, find some of these uh, Fast and the Furious guns uh, uh, during my time active uh, in the form of some FN 5.7 pistols that were used on uh, some of my friends uh, that I used to work with. This was an ATF operation. The ATF would approach uh, uh, places of uh, gun sales and keep an eye out for certain types of purchases of firearms. The ATF wanted to let these guns walk so they can track them down to Mexico to see if they can somehow make a case for something bigger. But realistically, all they did was let almost 2,000 guns walk across the border. And most Mexicans saw that as a major, not only betrayal by the United States, but also a bunch of conspiracy theories started popping up of, uh, of uh, you know, 
why would you introduce so many firearms into Mexico? The anti-American sentiment in Mexico is at an all-time high, and it's been growing. I think as a Mexican, somebody who was actually born down there and experienced some of the violence that some of these uh, firearms help foster down there. I think the biggest misconception about uh, gun smuggling is that these guns, uh, these guns have somehow, um, there's a lot of effort being put forth by the Mexican government to stop these guns from coming down to Mexico. The straw purchasers up here get a slap on the wrist. I think, yeah, some of those penalties should be steeper. The Mexican government, uh, through Marcelo Ebrard, is basically sued a, a lot of the major uh, American manufacturer, gun manufacturers. The only group legally allowed to sell firearms in Mexico was the military. Um, so it's interesting that uh, the, U the Mexican government uh, did a uh, lawsuit against American gun manufacturers, uh, but they didn't mention in that lawsuit the people that they buy their, their firearms from. Mexico has a very big problem with corruption, and uh, it has attempted many times to curtail this corruption by in, uh, developing whole organizations to try and keep police honest. I was put through FBI background checks. I did polygraph testing every year. Uh, but even with all of those safety precautions, people flipped. And when they left, uh, they didn't hand it over their rifles or their guns sometimes, so they would take them with them. I was a Baja police agent for about 12 years. I did that job till it was uh, till it was time to leave. The corruption levels in the institution that I was in became completely unsustainable, and anybody that wanted to actually do their job and be honest about it uh, was not in fashion or in vogue at that time. I uh, had to leave my job in a hurry. There's no uh, there's no retirement, no severance package. It's a pretty hard job to do. It's a pretty thankless one. But there's a lot of people that are in that fight, a lot of people that are honest, a lot of people that never took a dime. I somehow made it out alive of that system. After concluding my 12 years of service down there, I came to the United States and utilizing some of the experience and, and uh, know-how that I got from that experience uh, down south, I now become a subject matter expert, do training for civilians, private companies, and the government across the country. Specifically, gun smuggling has armed the people that killed a lot of the people that I used to work with. It definitely has had an effect, not just on me, but on, uh, on most of my generation. I want to give a voice to the countless people down there that went through some of the experiences that I went through. Um, some of the widows left behind, some of the uh, orphans left behind by some of the conflicts uh, that uh, went on down there. I'm trying to keep the, that memory and that voice uh, alive for them.